There wouldn't be a Pierce without the Texas FFA. My dad built Pierce from skills he learned from his time at the FFA. We're pulling for education. He's developed a team that serves the hardest working men and women in the work truck and trailer industry. We're pulling for teachers. We're pulling for agriculture. We know what it means to be in the FFA and we're pulling for you because so many of us came from the same place. We're, we're pulling, pulling for you. you. Well, hello, Texas FFA. This is Aaron Alejandro, the executive director of the Texas FFA Foundation. And uh, we've been bringing you a series of leadership um, opportunities called the Growing Our Future Leadership Series. Uh, I've always believed if you want to know what the future is, grow it. And the way you grow it is by planting seeds of greatness, nurturing those opportunities, and then taking advantage of them when it's time to harvest. Uh, I love the fact that we're able to bring together subject matter experts. Um, I'm a big believer that if you want to be the best, you train with the best. If you want to be the best, then find those folks that stand out as experts, ask them questions, and listen to what they have to say. Uh, I wish we were in a situation where we could be doing this live and be watching because we are going to have that opportunity when the Growing Our Future Leadership Series returns to Amarillo and we can actually do this live as we had originally intended. One of the things that I always start off with when I talk to students and teachers is I, I write the word question down. And then I ask the question, what is the root word of the word question? And the root word is quest, to go on an adventure. So we're about to go on an adventure. We're gonna spend some time together and I'm gonna ask y'all some questions. And because you're subject matter experts, you're going to be able to share with 200,000 students enrolled in ag classes, 139,000 Texas FFA members, and probably around 2,700 agricultural science teachers. So with that, are y'all ready to get started? Give me a guns up, thumbs up, or whatever y'all do up north, Matt. There you go. All right. Here we go. I'm going to start off and I'm going to go around the table and let everybody introduce themselves. Allison, we're going to start with you. Uh, Allison, if you will give us your name, title, uh, what you do now, and maybe a little bit about how you got there. Sure. So thanks so much for including me. My name is Allison Nevue. I'm based in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from Brenham, Texas. I think that was Area 3 at one point in time. Uh, I served as the Texas State President and 2009-2010, um, but I currently work for the U.S. Grains Council here in Washington as the manager of trade policy. So just to give you a, a really quick um, understanding of, of what we do, um, we work for farmers uh, all across the U.S., primarily in developing export markets overseas. So just like most ag products, Corn, barley, and sorghum is often sold to international customers, so my organization works to build those customers abroad. And my role in that is to think about um, all the tools that farmers might want to have access to and to use, whether that's GMOs and biotech or crop protection or now gene editing, and think about when those products end up overseas, how will that country treat that and how close are their regulations to ours? So sometimes that means um, you know, working with their regulatory bodies, sometimes it's writing comments, sometimes it's developing programs. So it's a really dynamic role that when I was in school, I had no idea that this job even existed. So how I ended up here is in an adventure in and of itself. Um, I think I've always approached my career with just a lot of curiosity. So when I first came out of school, um, I was really interested in understanding more of the finance side of how agriculture works. So I went to do uh, commodity trading. So I was trading sort of in like this um, stock market for ag products and missed um, the relationship with farmers. So I moved to DC to work directly on farm and farm problems. So really got into innovation in that space for fresh fruits and vegetables looking at some of the real challenges in their supply chain, what are the technologies that could help maybe solve some of those from robotics to blockchain, 
Um, and in digging into that, found that, oh, I really would love to understand sort of the regulatory hurdles and burdens that might keep those things from coming to market. So it's, it's a very long and windy path, um, but it's you know, really exciting to continue to be able to, to use a lot of the skills and knowledge that I learned in FSA and in agriculture and to continue to, to have a role in being that voice, um, whether that's overseas or here in the US. That's great, thanks Allison. Corey, tell us a little bit about you and what your role is and, and how you got there. So thank you, Aaron. Appreciate you having us today. Um, Corey Rosenbush, I'm the president and CEO of the Fertilizer Institute. We represent uh, the entire fertilizer supply chain from manufacturers to traders and distributors to agricultural retailers. And uh, I just recently got here. I actually uh, transitioned over to this role about four months ago, uh, right before COVID started and uh, came from a different trade association. There are associations for everything in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was running the Cold Chain Alliance, which represent companies that do distribution of perishable food products, so refrigerated warehousing and transportation. So it's been nice to go from one end of the food chain back down to the, uh, the beginning of the food chain and closer to my, to my ag roots. Um, but I'm most proud to uh, have grown up in Glen Rose, Texas. Uh, it still is Area 8, Allison. I don't think we changed. Uh, Lake Whitney District may have changed, but I think we're actually still there as well. My dad was an ag teacher, so uh, I grew up uh, really born into FFA. Um, remember very fondly when people like Aaron Alejandro, a state president, would come and uh, stay at our homes when they were making the round. I think. I think my house actually burnt down the day that Aaron uh, uh, came, and I'm not kidding. Um, uh, maybe it was the year after, I don't remember. It was Bruce Cobb. It was Bruce Cobb. You were the year after, I believe. And so, anyways, it was um, it was always fun to grow up around the program, and, and especially a family who grew up in FFA. My uncle's an ag teacher, my cousin's an ag teacher. I was the state FFA president in 95, 96, uh, National FFA president in 96, 97. And um, that really launched me into to the career that I have today and will forever be grateful for the skills and, and really the relationships that, that FFA provides. I, I appreciate that, Corey. I agree with you completely. Dan Hunter. Hi, Aaron. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you guys today. It's one of those things where you look back and you say, if there's anything you can do in the future with a job, it's to take an advantage of, of uh, visiting with folks and, and helping them understand not only what you do, but how maybe you get to that point in your life. Uh, just as a brief, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the elder of the group. I was a uh, state FFA officer in 81, 82. Um, and so uh, from the, actually, I, I was from area two and um, went to school in the big city of Roscoe. Actually, I grew up in the suburbs of Roscoe, so it's a, a pretty small place. But uh, after I finished uh, college, you know, people say, what do you do now? I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Texas. How do you get to that job? Um, I think without a doubt, agri agriculture is, is one of those areas that is going to continue to give opportunities to young people, not only in the United States, but around the world. I was very fortunate and like Allison and, and Aaron uh, and, uh, and Corey and, and Matt here have had the opportunity to spend some time in public service. Uh, I started my career in Washington, D.C., worked for a couple of different members of Congress. As uh, Corey mentioned, there's always plenty of associations in D.C. and I, uh, I was a lobbyist for the U.S. Cotton Council for, for many years. Uh, after that was CEO for the U.S. Peanut Growers for, for several years and then Prior to this position, it served about eight years as the executive director of a large research research institute, which we had projects on every continent but Antarctica. And so, you know, the question becomes, how did you discover your job in agriculture? It actually discovered me, and I was very fortunate to be asked and be appointed to this position. It's one of those things in, in agriculture, and I tell the folks that I get to work with every day, that we're the luckiest people in the world. Not everybody gets to have a job where you're gonna make a difference in people's lives every day. And that's what we get to do. We're gonna make a difference in people's lives every day, whether it's feeding them, helping them get through the regulatory burdens that they, they sometimes have challenges, or whether it's put them into new markets like Allison does. We work with folks 
around the world and you know, I get the opportunity to promote Texas products and, you know, take Texas, what we call take Texas worldwide. And uh, that's uh, that's one of those things that while it sells itself, uh, it's, it's a big part of our agriculture community here in Texas being one of the largest exporters in the United States of, of agriculture products. There's no doubt that I wouldn't be here without the FFA, wouldn't be here without uh, a great advisor and, and an opportunity to, to take advantage of the things that we do, get to do in making a difference in people's lives. And there's no doubt that FFA made a difference in my life. Wow. Thanks, Dan. Um, Matt, share with us a little bit uh, from the East Coast, a little bit. Sure, the only not in Texas on the panel here today, but Aaron, thank you. And what an honor it is to have a chance to, to be on this panel with such great leaders all across the country. So again, thank you for the chance to share. I have a wonderful job in Washington, D.C. I, I was appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture about two years ago as the Chief of the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. There's about 17 agencies within USDA. Um, I think uh, mine's the best. I have a chance to work with farmers and ranchers and private forest landowners all across the country to help them uh, address their resource concerns and help them uh, put conservation on the ground. We have about 10,000 NRCS employees across 3,000 service centers all across the country. And uh, what an honor it is to be able to work hand in hand with our producers to help them put conservation plans together, address their concerns, and then be able to provide cost share dollars to, to help them be better stewards of the land and help them be successful. I'm so blessed. I'm a fifth generation farmer in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, and I grew up working beside my grandfather and my father, and all I wanted to be was a farmer until I put on that blue and gold jacket for the first time and got involved in FFA, and I learned that it's a big world out there, and I learned my other passion of, of communicating, of policy, of being able to serve the agricultural industry I was very fortunate to serve as state president of Virginia and national vice president in the early 90s. Uh, one of my teammates, Lisa Ann King, was a, a fellow Texan, as you all know. And uh, so I had a chance to come to Texas many times during that year and fell in love with your state. But very fortunate after after graduating Virginia Tech, I uh, went back to the farm and then got involved in the community, uh, which led me to, to run for political office and served in our state legislature about 20 years ago. And then from that was able to be appointed to the Commissioner of Agriculture in Virginia. And then uh, from there work at Farm Credit for four years and then back to my family farm. And then I was literally in the sweet corn field one day picking sweet corn when I got a call from the secretary asking if I would be interested in joining the team at USDA. So uh, for all the young folks out there, I would say really the relationships, 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 is what it's all about. Just being able to work hard, to, to build those relationships and be open to uh, new opportunities. I never dreamed in a million years I'd be leading a federal agency in Washington, D.C., but, uh, you know, opportunities come to those that work hard and uh, prepare themselves. And certainly the FFA had a huge impact on my life and giving me many of the opportunities that I've been blessed to, to, to. Wow, well, there you have it. There's, a, there's an overview of the talent that has joined us today. Uh, we do appreciate so much y'all sharing a little bit of your time, talent, and treasures. We call that philanthropy, and we appreciate you being a good steward of the organization that kind of helped us all uh, get to where we're at. Uh, I just want to, while this is not the topic, I do think it, it kind of fits right here. Uh, one of the, you know, in life we have these experiences that we think are kind of unique and kind of neat, and we walk away going, man, that really felt good. Uh, I will never forget a social media message that I got one day from Matt Lore. And Matt sends me this message. I've no, I didn't know him from Come Sick'em. And here this message comes in from the Commissioner of Agriculture, Secretary of Agriculture, the state of Virginia. And I was like, wow. And it said, are you there in Alejandro that used to work for CEV Multimedia? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I used to use your tapes when I was an uh, ag team. Yeah. Off of that one correspondence, we've maintained a communication line. And it just shows you how small this world of agriculture and FFA is. And how if you'll just work at building relationships, you never know where they may go and what opportunities they may lead to. 
So I did want to mention that real quick because Matt, that's a story that I enjoy sharing with people. I remember that. And if, if I can follow up on that, remember when the, the song Alejandro was, was popular by Lady Gaga, I remember having some fun with you on that as well. So good memories over the years. <laughs> I do remember. So for those that are watching right now, don't get your Google out. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. But there was a great hockey player named Wayne Gretzky. And many people said that Gretzky was the greatest hockey player that ever played. And when asked what makes you such a great hockey player, Gretzky always said, most hockey players skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. Okay, I don't go to where it is, I head to where it's going. When we talk about agriculture, and we look just 30, just maybe between 30 and 35 years into the future, every indicator, every indicator says that we're gonna need between 65 and 80% more food than we have today. Uh, some of y'all may be able to update those numbers, but I know that it fluctuates in there in that range. The reality is we are about to have a very hungry world. Uh, there will be no more natural resources. They're not gonna make any more land. There's not gonna be any more water, but there's gonna be tremendous amount of demand, uh, both in terms of the food supply and our natural resources. I would say that to me, that screams career opportunity. I meant in a big way. So this panel with the expertise that y'all have globally, both domestically, globally, let's talk about careers in agriculture. And we'll go back the same way, Allison, we'll start with you, Corey, Dan, and then back to Matt. But what are some of your ideas? What would be some trends that you might throw out there um, Allison, I don't know if you know my good friend Tracy Talley or not, but Tracy uh, was with the American Seed Trade Association and he was telling me about GE as well and just kind of some trends that are happening there. But I would be curious uh, from your perspective, what are some career possibilities that students may not even be thinking about right now? Sure. Yeah, that's um, it's a really interesting question, and especially in the context of I think everything else going on in the world right now. Some of I've been really fortunate to work on technology specifically, so technology in the supply chain, technology and plant breeding, and um, it's it was kind of by accident. I grew up in food and ag, but I I love this space, and you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people from the tech world really embrace agriculture because it's this really complex, messy thing. There's all kinds of challenges that we need to solve. And um, so there's a lot of opportunity in that particular space where you're where you're crossing over into producing food, but also how can technology help us do that in a way that is better. Um, so when I was at, at Fruit and Vegetables, you know, I worked a lot on, on labor and automation. Um, I think that the shift towards that, towards technology, accelerating that is only going to become more important in the future. I work a lot now on the plant breeding side. I think there's a lot of promise for technologies like gene editing or biotech. And a lot of this is, is accelerating because of the conversations that we're having with consumers. Um, I think we're learning a lot more about how young people um, view the world and what they expect of their food and they're looking for I look for um, you know, How can we do a better job? So it's not just about producing more It's about how can you produce more with less? How can we take better care of the earth? How can we? Um, make sure that we're adding back to the soil. How can we reduce our carbon footprint? And I think that these technologies on the plant breeding side really advance that. So if you're interested in plant science, like, whoa, there you go, whole world. Um, for me, you know, being on the regulatory side, there's a lot of questions about how do we handle these products? There's a lot we don't know about them. Countries have different perspectives. And every single day in the policy world, I'm seeing different reactions, new countries coming up with their own standards. So in that space, I mean, that's going to be growing. Um, and then the sustainability space, which is sort of the lens that all of this fits into. You're seeing more and more companies develop their own teams thinking about how they set standards, how do we move the needle, and trying to figure out what is each organization's role in solving that puzzle. 
Um, so there, there's no shortage of, of problems to solve. And I think it just takes um, students that are really interested in some complex, messy areas. And there's a real added advantage for having taken ag science classes because you already come to that sort of world with a, a good foundation of understanding how everything works. Corey. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I when when you were telling the story and asking uh, about feeding the world and how we're going to do it, and, and you were saying it screams jobs, I thought you were going to say it screams fertilizer, uh, because <laughs> because we we believe we have a pretty big role in ensuring we can continue to grow uh, enough food to feed the growing population in a sustainable way. Um, but I would say from a trends perspective, there are three things that really come to mind as I think about the future of the world in agriculture. Uh, the first would be globalization. So when I was uh, a national officer, we get to go to Japan. I'm sure Matt remembers that trip well. And I, I got bit by the international bug and came back. And back then we actually had an internship with USDA and FFA where you could go overseas and work at a, uh, a foreign embassy and uh, for the foreign ag service. And, and that's what I did. And I, um, I always kind of had a passion for uh, international agriculture and really how connected uh, the entire uh, globe is when we think about uh, food consumption and where food comes from. And so I think the view, uh, a global view of the world is so critical as we think about future careers. And if there was one thing that I don't, felt, don't feel like I really received, uh, in my uh, ag education experience was that global perspective, yet it is so critical in what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and really the, the first part of my career before I landed, DC, landed in DC, which was doing international development work and, and actually lived in Indonesia for three years. So I think, I think a global mindset is critical. The second, uh, I, I agree with Allison and would just build off what she said in terms of uh, what I describe as the disconnect between food and agriculture. And um, when I changed jobs from GCCA is just as an example, uh, mainly working with consumer packaged good, uh, the consumer packaged good industry. Um, and, and I moved over to the Fertilizer Institute. There was a, uh, and I hope none, none of them will hear this, but there is a group of association CEOs in the food industry uh, that actually kicked me out of their group because they said I was no longer part of the food industry. And, you know, the, the, there are no production agriculture people represented at the table because there really is this incredible divide between food and ag. And I think especially as we think about the consumer and how loud the consumer is in terms of demand for what they are eating, um, we need to bring that connection back. And I, I think if a young person can figure out how to bridge that gap, and ensure that agriculture has a voice to the consumer and we're not just reacting to it and the food companies aren't just reacting to it. I think there's a powerful opportunity there. Um, and then last but not least, my third, my third trend is just uh, data and data analytics. Uh, I feel like the entire world is really being driven by data, whether it's policy, uh, operations, uh, from our standpoint as an industry, um, we get we get to uh, really focus a lot on stewardship uh, of fertilizers and ensure that it's being used in a way that um, uh, not only helps increase yields, but ensure that we're um, doing right by the environment and land. And uh, as we look at some of the programs that we put into place, the question that we get most often from policymakers is what does the data say? How do these practices actually influence uh, the farmer, uh, the economics of the farmer, but more importantly, the impact on the environment. And so I feel like more and more, any job, any place, anytime, anywhere, uh, you really have to look at the data. So uh, those analytic skills, I think are gonna be important. Hello, I'm Patty Beckham. And I went to we're here to support the Texas FFA today, and we're proud to say that the young leaders of today will take care of our tomorrow. That's why we like Texas FFA. By the way, I will tell you that within Texas Team Agate, I know my colleagues probably get tired of me always trying to measure stuff, but we were at Prefort Manufacturing, and I'll never forget it. Prefort said, anything that goes out our doors, if we can't measure it, we don't do it.
And I'm gonna tell you, that was a that was a real eye opener. So uh, it, I started drilling down into everything we do, everything, the analytics on our social media, open rates on emails. Um, because if you don't drill that down, you don't find out what's working and what's not. So I agree with you. I think that is a great observation and great opportunity. Uh, sorry to jump in on that one, Dan, but go right ahead, Dan. What no, you- and, and I'll kind of piggyback on just what you said. You know, I think there's one thing that I learned, you know, throughout my career is that you can't manage what you can't measure. So I think it's very important when you talk about those data that come in and how you handle those things. I don't think there's any doubt when we talk about uh, producing the, the food and fibers, we feed and clothe people not only here in the United States and around the world, but the things that Allison and, and Corey have mentioned with regards to technology, innovation, the global marketplace are critically important. You know, we talk about the size of, of the world and what it's going to look like. You know, it's going to double over the next 30 years as far as the population is concerned. And you're right, Aaron. There is a big concern. How do we how do we feed that many people? How do we feed twice as many people as we have today? And I think it's, while it's, uh, it, it is a paradigm shift, it's gonna be one of those things where when you talk about careers in agriculture, yes, no doubt, production agriculture is still gonna be the, the basic of all of it. But the reality is, is that innovation, technology, whether it's in science or whether it's with regards to marketing, whether it's to supply chain, you know, the way that we move product around the world today is completely different than what we did 20, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. You know, what we produce today and, and, and whether it goes through a, a processing facility, what's what's done today is sometimes on the on the plate of someone in Japan or, or Korea or Australia or Europe, you know, anywhere in Europe but tomorrow. So we have, you know, this global network we talk about and it's instantaneous from the standpoint that the way we buy and sell food today is different than what it was 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, those personal contacts are critically important. We start looking at trade agreements and those types of things. So when when we realize that the food we produce here in the United States is sent around the world, that's even gonna be a bigger case because when you talk about the Dublin population, that population is mainly gonna be grown outside of the United States of America. And so the product that we produce, the food we produce, the fiber we produce is gonna be sent around the world. I think one of the things that we've seen and are gonna to continue to see is how the consumer reacts to the marketplace. Two, 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 I think, observations as we've gone through COVID here recently. I think you're finding a consumer out there that is more interested in where their food is coming from. I think they have an awareness that food could get short at any moment. When they started going to the grocery stores and realizing that, oh my gosh, the meat counter is not full. Uh, or, oh my gosh, you know, there's not as many fruits and vegetables in, in the produce section, or in some cases, completely sold out. I think there became a greater awareness with regards to the consumer and where their food came from. I hope it continues. I hope people continue to realize that food just doesn't show up on the shelf, that they realize that, you know, there are farmers out there that have to deal with distribution, whether it's in slaughter plants, whether it's processing plants, or whatever it is that impacts how we get food to the grocery store and to their tables. Which brings up the second point. I think this is gonna be the biggest paradigm shift we see in agriculture with regards to marketing. And that is people have learned that they don't have to go to the grocery store three or four times a week to get their food in. People are having all their food delivered to their door or they're getting curbside pickup or those types of things. I think the opportunities in agriculture expand off of that. We now, we, we, launched a, a site here in Texas, uh, you know, as far as just for Texas products where people could connect directly with, with the, the producer to the consumer. And what we're seeing is, is that people are going to start buying that direct, uh, uh, you know, product from the person that actually produced it. And so we're seeing, I think, a paradigm shift, not only in the way how people buy products, but also how they get it and where they get it from. And so that, you know, when you talk about that, that's not just basic agriculture production. We're talking about marketing, we're talking about technology, we're talking about innovation. We're talking about all those things that are important in getting that food from from someone's farm all the way to the table. And then once again, I think the continued uh, interest in farm fresh products, knowing what we eat, knowing how we eat them and what we do with them and how we cook them are gonna be critical. So that supply chain all the way to the to the dinner table is gonna be critical year round. But I think we're seeing some paradigm shifts in agriculture that are going to create even more opportunities out there for agriculture and also for people who are gonna be involved in agriculture every day. Excellent. Matt, give us your perspective. 
Well, Aaron, when you're on a panel with a, a lot of really smart people, there's not much to be said when you're the last one. Uh, certainly appreciate the comments and I, I would echo every single one of the comments of, of the panelists here. You know, as, as Dan was saying, I think COVID has highlighted some things for us as a society. I think people now, I tell people, I think the two careers that I think have been elevated in the eyes of our general public are farmers and teachers. Um, as a dad of a, a lot of kids that we had to become homeschool parents. Yeah. Certainly, uh, we appreciate the work that our teachers do. And when you go to the grocery store and, and you're out of bacon and milk and products, I think people really appreciate uh, the folks that are raising their food. So people are definitely are, are much more aware now um, of, of where their food comes from, how it's raised. And certainly in my world of conservation, uh, we have a front row, uh, front row seat to being able to see how those demands are playing out. Um, I'm fortunate to be the first farmer in 30 years to lead NRCS. So um, I'm able to bring that farmer perspective uh, to every decision that we make and the policies that we set. But but really the trends are people as a society, it, you can just look at any company and see how they have their sustainability plans and they're looking at how they can reduce their carbon footprint and everything is based on more sustainable, more efficient, uh, more, more efficient in how they, they produce these products. And that's only gonna to continue uh, to increase, I think, as we go forward. Um, with conservation, we work with producers to produce more with less, being more efficient with their water usage, uh, being more efficient in, in how they care for the soil and elevating that important soil health, reducing, like I said, the, the um, environmental footprint and, and the importance of carbon sequestration and the trading carbon credits. I think that's gonna be more and more important. So all of all of these trends people are more aware and certainly they're more aware in how their food is produced uh, presents a lot of career opportunities in that whole world of environmental sustainability as we go forward we've got a lot of food we've got to produce for a lot of mouths but uh, but more people are watching how that food production takes place and uh, that's going to present a lot of opportunities for this next generation man y'all guys that's great insights right there um, really good stuff. Um, one of the things that uh, that we've talked about, um, obviously we're talking about careers in agriculture. I'll share with y'all an example. Uh, many of you know Mr. Richard Walrath. He's the largest individual donor in the history of FFA. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you've heard about this man, but he's given over $27 million to 4-H and FFA kids just in the state of Texas. So they were making a movie about him and the executive producer wanted to know more about FFA agriculture and how this thing worked. Because he made a comment, he said, Aaron, are, are there really any jobs for these kids? Is there really any opportunities? And so I told him, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fly into the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, meet me there and you and I are gonna talk. So he flew in and we started at Reliance Center on one end of the building. And for those that have been to Reliance Center, you know how big it is. We walked from one end of Reliance Center to the other. When we got to the other end, I looked at him and I said, Jay, I said, how many different species did you see? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, well, Jay, let's unpack that. You saw pig, you saw beef, you saw dairy, you saw goat, you saw, you know, uh, chickens and rabbits and anyway we went through all the species he goes yeah i guess i did see a lot of species i said now jay within each species how many different breeds did you see and he goes well i don't know and i said well you saw angus and brangus and red angus and herefords and guernseys and you know suffolks and rambolay and it just went on and on and on and he said wow and i said every one of them have trade associations every one of them are marketing their products around the world and he goes, man, Aaron, there's a lot of opportunity in agriculture. And so I think a lot of times, one of the challenges that we have is as young leaders, so now we're gonna talk talking to the FFA members and the teachers, we've gotta be creative in the way that we communicate these messages to show people that there's great opportunity, great opportunity, not only in, in business, but to be a problem solver. And going back to what Dan and, and Corey and others said, helping other people. Um, I think that's a that's a very noble thing. So I just want to make sure we talk about that when we talk about scope. I'm going to throw one more comment out there and then we're going to go around for our last round, Robin, let you wrap up with, with closing comments. If there's ever been a time, and y'all alluded to it, if there's ever been a time, I don't think we did a we did a, a workshop earlier. The public does not want to be educated, by the way. 
But if there's ever been a time for agricultural literacy, it is right now. And I think this is an opportunity to talk about production and consumption. Uh, if people aren't taking their kids to school, if the kids aren't eating at school, if we're not going to restaurants, if we're not going to sporting events, if we're not consuming, and then we have issues at packing you know, facilities, all of a sudden you back up the entire supply chain, the entire food chain as we know it, all the way down to the person that puts the corn in the ground. If there's ever been an opportunity for us to capitalize on food and agricultural literacy, I think it is right now. So that again speaks to the career opportunities that exist. So with that, let's do our final round robin. Allison, anything, words of encouragement you would share with FFA members and teachers about pursuing a career in agriculture? Oh gosh. Um, well, I would say, you know, I think that there is, we've talked about a lot of opportunities in a lot of different spaces. Um, and, and when we get to the end of this, I might learn that I'm wrong. So you can come back in 30 years and telling me that I'm giving bad advice. But when I was first starting out, I was, I was thinking about my career and about the functional jobs that I would have. So like, do I want to go into sales? Do I want to go into marketing? Do I want to go into policy? And what has served me well so far um, is to follow my interest into an area and to explore that area as deeply as you possibly can to, to understand it fully and to question why do we do the things that we do and is there a better way to go about this and then follow it to the next bunny trail. Um, I don't think that careers are linear anymore. Um, I don't think that you have to stay in one type of job for a significant period of time. And so I think it's about approaching your career with a certain level of curiosity. I can't forecast even at the end of my career what the jobs will look like, what the world will look like, and what kind of role I'll need to fill. Um, so it's about sort of discovering as deeply as you possibly can and questioning as much as you possibly can along the way until you find sort of the next entry point into something else. Um, so that's advice that I, I wish that someone would have told me that I don't have to have it all mapped out and that I, you don't have to be so rigid in how you approach um, where you're starting because it's, it's going to take its own path and careers are very fluid. Excellent. Corey? Yeah, so Aaron, you got to tell a Matt Lore story, so I'm jealous I did not get to tell a Matt Lore story. So I'm going to wrap up with a Matt story. Um, we, we all joke that we always remember our, our first time, our first kiss, our first date. Well, for me, Matt was my first, not kiss, not date, sorry, Matt. Uh, Matt was my first ever, first, first ever uh, national FFA officer I met, and I was in eighth grade at the time. And I never would have dreamed that our worlds would intersect 20 years later. Um, and I, I think the moral of the story is the people you are meeting right now through FFA are people that you will work with for the rest of your life. And um, the, the network and the relationships that you make are what will get you your job and your career, probably more so than anything else that you will learn or experience. Um, I had the opportunity to do graduate work at Harvard and everybody is always impressed by that. And the truth is, is that that experience doesn't even touch my two strongest networks in life. It's a distant third behind Texas A&M and then number one, which is FFA. And, and it's really that relationship, the relationships that, that I have from FFA that has meant everything for my career and, and my experiences. So really uh, cherish those connections you make even in high school because they will definitely be some that you will utilize uh, later in life. My second message is actually for ag teachers and I think for many people that are probably going to be listening, they, they probably did, haven't even heard of what their career is going to be at this point in life. What, it, what you will be doing one day is something that you're not even aware exists likely right now and so I would say keep that open mind. And for me, um, you know, we know what, what we're exposed to through our classroom or our friends, our experience. And, and as I did not understand what international ag was about when I first left school, 
Um, I actually had the opportunity to take my dad to Africa on a, a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation project that we were doing. And so he spent a lot of time with me working with some of the farmers in Kenya. And I think that really shaped uh, a completely different perspective and view on agriculture from maybe what we think about traditionally in the Midwest or even in Texas. And so to be able to take that experience back to the classroom and open a student's eye to something that they may not even know exists is so critical. And I, I think that ag teachers can't underestimate the influence and power that they have and even their need to kind of step outside the box and, and broaden their horizons because it'll make an impact. I agree. Dan? Well, and I, you know, it's it's one of those things when you talk about education, you talk about what an important role teachers play in your life. I think it's, it's important that we, one of the things we encourage all of the students, and, and I encourage you as, as teachers to, to do this, is to make everyone an educator. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in, in, in the fact that I have an older brother and an older sister who are involved in that, uh, ag education. You know, my sister was the first female agriculture teacher in the state of Texas. My brother's been an ag science teacher for 40 years. Uh, she still to this day trains agriculture uh, teachers around the state, around the, around the country. So I'm, I, I didn't realize the education part and the role that we all have to play on that. I was very fortunate in my previous car, uh, career that I was also an adjunct professor and had the opportunity to get in the classroom and teach. And that's when I realized that that's incumbent upon all of us is, is that you need to give those students and you need to be as teachers willing to provide the tools so that they can educate others. Because one of the biggest challenges we face in agriculture is an uneducated population, not knowing what a GMO is, not understanding how important fertilizer is to the product. All they hear is sometimes that the devil's orange are associated with those products. You know, and it's it's one of those things when you look at someone, they say, oh, I don't eat any, anything that's a GMO. And I look at them, when did you stop eating? Because everything we eat today is genetically modified in one form or another. And so it's one of those things, I think we provide those tools to students. And, and I always say, you know, tell them this, as they look for careers, and regardless of, of how close it's tied to agriculture, at some level, it has an ag component to it. But don't be afraid of failure. You know, anyone who has never failed has never tested their abilities. And I think that's what you want them to do is to test their ability, see what they're good at, see how good they can do things, and then take it to the next level. And finally, you know, I, I, I would say this, as you start looking at careers as students, as you start thinking about what you want to do, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do as soon as I graduated from, from college, and it ended up not being the thing I did at all, and I ended up doing something else that took me down a different road. But if there's one thing that I've learned over my lifetime and, and over the fortunate side of not only being you know involved in uh, as, as far as public service and then being in the private sector and then being back in public service. And I often look at people and I say, I want you to listen to this very carefully because it's a secret. The secret to your success is when you stop worrying about your own success and do all you can to make those around you successful. And that's what we do in agriculture. We make those people around us successful so that they can feed and clothe the world as we know it today. And I just want to say, I, I congratulate every teacher out there. I congratulate every student out there for the wonderful things that you guys are doing and for knowing that we have a great future ahead of us. So thank you very much for having us here. Thanks, Dan. Matt? Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity and, and especially Aaron and Corey to be able to reminisce and tell some stories. And uh, I remember all of those uh, stories that were told very well. And um, Allison and Dan, it's a pleasure to, to meet you virtually and be a part of here. Um, FFA is a wonderful, wonderful experience. There's not a day that goes by in my life where I'm not reminded in some capacity, some example, some person, some whatever, I'm not reminded of my time in FFA. Um, you know, 30 years later, it, it truly, truly impacts lives in, a, in an amazing way. Uh, following up with what Corey said, you know, my advice for young people is it really does come down to relationships. I look back on my life and every opportunity that I've been afforded, running for office, appointed for office, everything I've done has been because of people that I've met 
friendships developed and those experiences that, you know, when, when you meet someone 20 years ago, you never dream in a million years um, how that person's going to come back in your life um, and be able to play a role at some other point. So relationships matter. It really more important than, than your, your skills and what you do. It's, it's people that you have a chance to work with. And I really, really encourage young people today. I've got some kids and they would much rather text someone than call them. Uh, you know, technology's changed the way we communicate. And I'm like, That's, you got to build those relationships. The second thing I would say that I've learned, the, the one thing that has served me probably more in my entire life is the ability to communicate. And that is what FFA has done for me. I was a shy, quiet arm kid. And FFA taught me how to speak, how to run a meeting, how to share a thought. And, you know, it doesn't matter what career path someone chooses, but you can get up in front of a crowd and express an idea and motivate and inspire with your words. Um, you're going to be successful. And for me, that all came from FFA and my ag teacher, particularly, who pushed me and pushed me even when I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but that's that's really what it's all about. It's being able to have that communicative skills. And certainly for young people today, it's so very, very important. Um, and you know, the last thing I would say is you just got to be the hardest working person in the room. Um, I've been blessed to be in and to be available for opportunities that have come about. And people say, well, you know, you're just lucky. You always seem to be at the right place at the right time. And there's probably a little truth in that. But to me, you know, luck is when that preparation meets opportunity. It takes hard work. And uh, nobody's going to outwork me in life, I've learned. Um, if, if you're willing to put the time in, you're willing to sacrifice and dedicate and do everything you need to do, uh, it's amazing how those opportunities are going, to, are going to be afforded to you. So, you know, really relationships, being able to develop those communication skills and just outwork everyone. And, and I promise you, uh, you're going to find plenty of success in life. Well, I'm going to put us back on gallery view so we're all able to see each other as we kind of wave goodbye to the Texas FFA members, teachers, stakeholders, and everybody that uh, that's joined us today. Uh, again, thank you. Incredible, incredible insights. Uh, Texas is so blessed. Um, we're blessed because of people like, like you sharing and your willingness to share. Um, Guarantee you there's some kid right now sitting somewhere in a classroom and something everybody, each of you said, guarantee you is going to make a difference down the road. And for me, with my grandson, that makes a big difference. So thank you for your willingness to share. If y'all will all wave goodbye, I'll, I'll stop the recording and we'll jump back on for a quick debrief real quick. Hey, Texas FFA members, be sure to tune in for the 92nd Annual Texas FFA Convention. Strive for greatness. Strive to be great. We know you are. Hey, while you're at convention, be sure to check out the Foundation's Virtual Scavenger Hunt. We're going to be giving away a $1,000 award scholarship every day from the students who get all of the scavenger hunt questions correct. So be sure to take a chance. Go to mytexasffa.org. Good luck.